The Compart 2 By Aristotle Audiobook 24x44 The sense of seeing is not deceived as to color, nor is that of hearing as to sound. On the other hand, they reduce the proper to common sensibles, as Democritus does with white and black, for he asserts that the latter is a mode of the rough, and the former a mode of the smooth, while he reduces savors to the atomic figures. Yet surely no one sense, or, if any, the sense of sight rather than any other, can discern the common sensibles. But if we suppose that the sense of taste is better able to do so, then since to discern the smallest objects in each kind is what marks the acutest sense taste should have been he sense which best perceived the common sensibles generally, and showed the most perfect power of discerning figures in general. Again, all the sensibles involve contrariety, e.g. In color white is contrary to black, and in savors bitter is contrary to sweet, but no one figure is reckoned as contrary to any other figure. Else, to which of the possible polygonal figures to which Democritus reduces bitter is the spherical figure to which he reduces sweet contrary? Again, since figures are infinite in number, savors also should be infinite, the possible rejoinder that they are so, only that some are not perceived cannot be sustained for why should one savor be perceived, and another not? This completes our discussion of the object of taste, i.e. Savor, for the other affections of savors are examined in their proper place in connection with natural history of plants. Our conception of the nature of odors must be analogous to that of savors, inasmuch as the sapid dry effects in air and water alike, but in a different province of sense, precisely what the dry effects in the moist of water only. We customarily predicate translucency of both air and water in common. But it is not qua translucent that either is a vehicle of odor, but qua possessed of a power of washing or rinsing and so imbibing the sapid dryness. For the object of smell exists not in air only. It also exists in water. This is proved by the case of fishes and testacea, which are seen to possess the faculty of smell, although water contains no air, for whenever air is generated within water it rises to the surface and these creatures do not respire. Hence, if one were to assume that air and water are both moist, it would follow that odor is the natural substance consisting of the sapid dry diffused in the moist, and whatever is off these kind would be an object off smell. That the property of odorousness is based upon the sapid may be seen by comparing things which possess with those which do not possess odor. The elements, viz. Fire air, earth, water, are inodorous, because both the dry and the moist among them are without sapidity, unless some added ingredient produces it. This explains why sea water possesses odor, for unlike elemental water it contains savor and dryness. Salt, too, is more odorous than natron, as the oil which exudes from the former proves, for natron is allied to elemental earth more near light hands out. Again, a stone is inodorous, just because it is tasteless, while, on the contrary, wood is odorous, because it is sapid. The kinds of wood, too, which contain more elemental water are less odorous than others. Moreover, to take the case of metals, gold is inodorous because it is without taste, but bronze and iron are odorous, and when the sapid moisture has been burnt out of them, their slag is, in all cases, less odorous the metals than the metals themselves. Silver and tin are more odorous than the one class of metals, less so than the other, inasmuch as they are water to a greater degree than the former, to a less degree than the latter. Some writers look upon fumid exhalation, which is a compound of earth and air, as the essence of odor. Indeed all are inclined to rush to this theory of odor. Heraclitus implied his adherence to it when he declared that if all existing things were turned into smoke, the nose would be the organ to discern them with. All writers inclined to refer odor to this cause sc. Exhalation of some sort, but some regard it as aqueous, others as fumid, exhalation, while others, 
again, hold it to be either. Aqueous exhalation is merely a form of moisture, but fumid exhalation is, as already remarked, composed of air and earth. The former when condensed turns into water, the latter, in a particular species of earth. Now, it is unlikely that odor is either of these. For vaporous exhalation consists of mere water which, being tasteless, is inodorous, and fumid exhalation cannot occur in water at all, though, as has been before stated, aquatic creatures also have the sense of smell. Again, the exhalation theory of odor is analogous to the theory of emanations. If, therefore, the latter is untenable, so, too, is the former. It is clearly conceivable that the moist, whether in air, for air, too, is essentially moist, or in water, should imbibe the influence of, and have effects wrought in it by, the sapid dryness. Moreover, if the dry produces in moist media, i.e. water and air, an effect as of something washed out in them, it is manifest that odors must be something analogous to savors. Nay, indeed, this analogy is, in some instances, a fact registered in language, for odors as well as savors are spoken of as pungent, sweet, harsh, astringent rich equals savory, and one might regard fetid smells as analogous to bitter tastes, which explains why the former are offensive to inhalation as the latter are to deglutition. It is clear, therefore, that odor is in both water and air what savor is in water alone. This explains why coldness and freezing render savors dull, and abolish odors altogether, for cooling and freezing tend to annul the kinetic heat which helps to fabricate sapidity. There are two species oft odorous. For the statement of certain writers that the odorous is not divisible into species is false, it is so divisible. We must here define the sense in which these species are to be admitted or denied. One class of odors, then, is that which runs parallel, as has been observed, to savors. To odors of this class their pleasantness or unpleasantness belongs incidentally. For owing to the fact that savors are qualities of nutrient matter, the odors connected with these e.g. Those of a certain food are agreeable as long as animals have an appetite for the food, but they are not agreeable to them when sated and no longer in want of fit, nor are they agreeable, either, to those animals that do not like the food itself which yields the odors. Hence, as we observed, these odors are pleasant or unpleasant incidentally, and the same reasoning explains why it is that they are perceptible to all animals in common. The other class of odors consists of those agreeable in their essential nature, e.g. those of flowers. For these do not in any degree stimulate animals to food, nor do they contribute in any way to appetite, their effect upon it, if any, is rather the opposite. For the verse of Strati's ridiculing Euripides' use not perfumerito flavor soup, contains a truth. Those who nowadays introduce such flavors into beverages deforce our sense of pleasure by habituating us to them, until, from two distinct kinds of sensations combined, pleasure arises as it might from unsimple kind. Of this species of odor man alone is sensible, the other, viz. That correlated with tastes, is, as has been said before, perceptible also to the lower animals. And odors of the latter sort, since their pleasurableness depends upon taste, are divided into as many species as there are different tastes, but we cannot go on to say this of the former kind of odor, since its nature is agreeable or disagreeable per se. The reason why the perception of such odors is peculiar to man is found in the characteristic state of man's brain. For his brain is naturally cold and the blood which it contains in its vessels is thin and pure but easily cooled, whence it happens that the exhalation arising from food, being cooled by the coldness of this region, produces unhealthy rooms, therefore it is that odors of such a species have been generated for human beings, as a safeguard to health. This is their sole function, and that they perform it is evident. For food, 
whether dry or moist, though sweet to taste, is often unwholesome, whereas the odor arising from what is fragrant, that odor which is pleasant in its own right, is, so to say, always beneficial to persons in any state of bodily health whatever. For this reason, too, the perception of odor in general affected through respiration, noting all animals, butin man and certain other sanguineous animals, e.g. quadrupeds, and all that participate freely in the natural substance air, because when odors, on account of the lightness oft heat in them, mount o the brain, the health of this region is thereby promoted. For odor, as a power, is naturally heat-giving. Thus nature has employed respiration for two purposes. Primarily for the relief thereby brought to the thorax, secondarily for the inhalation of odor. For while an animal is inhaling odor moves in through its nostrils, as it were from a side entrance. But the perception of the second class of odors above described does not belong to all animal, but is confined to human beings, because man's brain is, in proportion to his whole bulk, larger and moister than the brain of any other animal. This is the reason of the further fact that man alone, so to speak, among animals perceives and takes pleasure in the odors of flowers and such things. For the heat and stimulation set up by these odors are commensurate with the excess of moisture and coldness in his cerebral region. Only the other animals which have lungs, nature has bestowed their due perception of one of the two kinds of odor i.e. that connected with nutrition through the act of respiration, guarding against the needless creation of two organs of sense, for in the fact that they respire the other animals have already sufficient provision for their perception of the one species of odor only, as human beings have for their perception of both. But that creatures which do not respire have the olfactory sense is evident. For fishes, and all insects as a class, have, thanks to the species of odor correlated with nutrition, a keen olfactory sense of their proper food from a distance, even when they are very far away from it, such is the case with bees, and also with the class of small ants, which some denominate nipes. Among marine animals, too, the murex and many other similar animals have an acute perception of their food by its odor. Itis notequally certain what organ is whereby they so perceive. This question, of the organ whereby they perceive odor, may well cause a difficulty, if we assume that smelling takes place in animals only while respiring, for that this is the fact is manifest in all the animals which do respire, whereas none of those just mentioned respires, and yet they have the sense of smell unless, indeed, they have some other sense not included in the ordinary five. This supposition is, however, impossible. For any sense which perceives odor is a sense of smell, and this they do perceive, though probably not in the same way as creatures which respire, but when the latter are respiring the current of breath removes something that is laid like a lid upon the organ proper, which explains why they do not perceive odors when not respiring, while in creatures which do not respire this is always off. Just as some animals have eyelids on their eyes, and when these are not raised they cannot see, whereas hard-eyed animals have no lids, and consequently do not need, besides eyes, an agency to raise the lids, but see straightway without intermission from the actual moment at which it is first possible for them to do so i.e. from the moment when an object first comes within their field of vision. Consistently with what has been said above, not one of the lower animals shows repugnance to the odor of things which are essentially ill-smelling, unless one of the latter is positively pernicious. They are destroyed, however, by these things, just as human beings are, i.e. as human beings get headaches from, and are often asphyxiated by, the fumes of charcoal, so the lower animals perish from the strong fumes of brimstone and bituminous substances, and it is owing to experience of such effects that they shun these. For the disagreeable odor in itself they care nothing whatever, though the odors of many plants are essentially disagreeable, unless, indeed, it has some effect upon the taste of their food. 
the senses making up an odd number, and an odd number having always a middle unit, the sense of smell occupies in itself as it were a middle position between the tactual senses, i.e. touch and taste, and those which perceive through a medium, i.e. sight and hearing. Hence the object of smell, too, is an affection of nutrient substances, which fall within the class of tangibles, and is also an affection of the audible and the visible, whence it is that creatures have the sense of smell both in air and water. Accordingly, the object of smell is something common to both of these provinces, i.e. it appertains both to the tangible on the one hand, and on the other to the audible and translucent. Hence the propriety of the figure by which it has been described by us as an immersion or washing of dryness in the moist and fluid. Such then must be our account of the sense in which one is or is not entitled to speak oft odorous as having species. The theory held by certain of the Pythagoreans, that some animals are nourished by odors alone, is unsound. For, in the first place, we see that food must be composite since the bodies nourished by it are not simple. This explains why waste matter is secreted from food, either within the organisms, or, as in plants, outside them. But since even water by itself alone, that is, when unmixed, will not suffice for food for anything which is to form a consistency must be corporeal, it is still much less conceivable that air should be so corporealized and thus fitted to be food. But, besides this, we see that all animals have a receptacle for food, from which, when it has entered, the body absorbs it. Now, the organ which perceives odor is in the head, and odor enters with the inhalation of the breath, so that it goes to the respiratory region. It is plain, therefore, that odor, qua odor, does not contribute to nutrition, that, however, it is serviceable to health is equally plain, as well by immediate perception as from the arguments above employed, so that odor is in relation to general health what savor is in the province of nutrition and in relation to the bodies nourished. This then must conclude our discussion of the several organs of sense perception. One might ask. If every body is infinitely divisible, are its sensible qualities color, savor, odor, sound? weight, cold or heat, heaviness or lightness, hardness or softness also infinitely divisible. Or, is this impossible? One might well ask this question, because each of them is productive of sense perception, since, in fact, all derive their name of sensible qualities from the very circumstance of their being able to stimulate this. Hence, if these is so both our perception of them should likewise be divisible to infinity, and every part of a body however small should be a perceptible magnitude. For it is impossible, e.g. to see a thing which is white but not of a certain magnitude. Since if it were not so, if its sensible qualities were not divisible, peri passu with body, we might conceive a body existing but having no color or weight or any such quality, accordingly not perceptible at all. For these qualities are the objects of sense perception. On this supposition, every perceptible object should be regarded as composed not of perceptible but of imperceptible parts. Yet it must be really composed of perceptible parts, since assuredly it does not consist of mathematical and therefore purely abstract and nonsensible quantities. Again, by what faculty should we discern and cognize these hypothetical real things without sensible qualities? Is it by reason? But they are not objects of reason, nor does reason apprehend objects in space, except when it acts in conjunction with sense perception. At the same time, if this be the case that there are magnitudes, physically real, but without sensible quality, it seems to tell in favor of the atomistic hypothesis. For thus, indeed, by accepting this hypothesis, the question with which this chapter begins might be solved negatively. But it is impossible to accept this hypothesis. Our views on the subject of atoms are to be found in our treatise on movement. 
The solution of these questions will bring with it also the answer to the question why the species of color, taste, sound, and other sensible qualities are limited. For in all classes of things lying between extremes the intermediates must be limited. But contraries are extremes, and every object of sense perception involves contrariety. E.g. In color, white x black, in savor, sweet x bitter, and in all the other sensibles also the contraries are extremes. Now, that which is continuous is divisible into an infinite number of unequal parts, but into a finite number of equal parts, while that which is not per se continuous is divisible into species which are finite in number. Since then, the several sensible qualities of things are to be reckoned as species, while continuity always subsists in these we must take account of the difference between the potential and the actual. It is owing to this difference that we do not actually see its tent house anth part in a grain of millet, although sight has embraced the whole grain within its scope, and it is owing to this, too, that the sound contained in a quarter tone escapes notice, and yet one hears the whole strain, inasmuch as it is a continuum but the interval between he extreme sounds that bound the quarter tone escapes the ear being only potentially audible, not actually. So, in the case of other objects of sense, extremely small constituents are unnoticed, because they are only potentially not actually perceptible e.g. visible, unless when they have been parted from the holes. So the foot length too exists potentially in the two foot length but actually only when it has been separated from the whole. But objective increments so small as those above might well, if separated from their totals, instead of achieving actual existence be dissolved in their environments, like a drop of sapid moisture poured out into the sea. But even if this were not so sc. With the objective magnitude, still, since the subjective of sense perception is not perceptible in itself, nor capable of separate existence, since it exists only potentially in the more distinctly perceivable whole of sense perception, so neither will it be possible to perceive actually its correlatively small object sc. Its quantum of pathema or sensible quality when separated from the object total. But yet this small object is to be considered as perceptible. For it is both potentially so already i.e. even when alone, and destined to be actually so when it has become part of an aggregate. Thus, therefore, we have shown that some magnitudes and their sensible qualities escape notice, and the reason with it oh so, as well as the manner in which they are still perceptible or not perceptible in such cases. Accordingly then when these minutely subdivided sensibles have once again become aggregated in a whole in such a manner, relatively to one another, as to be perceptible actually, and not merely because they are in the whole, but even apart from it, it follows necessarily from what has been already stated that their sensible qualities, whether colors, or tastes or sounds, are limited in number. One might ask do the objects of sense perception, or the movements proceeding from them, since movements there are in whichever of the two ways viz. By emanations or by stimulatory kinesis sense perception takes place, when these are actualized for perception, always arrive first at a spatial middle point between he sense organ and its object, as odor evidently does, and also sound. For he who is nearer to the odorous object perceives the odor sooner than who is farther away, and the sound of a stroke reaches us some time after it has been struck. Is it this also with an object seen? and with light? Empedocles, for example, says that light from th soon arrives first in the intervening space before it comes to the eye, or reaches the earth. This might plausibly seem to be the case. For whatever is moved in space, is moved from one place to another, hence there must be a corresponding interval of time also in which it is moved from the one place to the other. But any given time is divisible into parts, so that we should assume a time when the sun's ray was not as yet seen, but was still travelling in the middle space. Now, even if it be true that the acts of hearing and having heard, and, generally, those of perceiving and having perceived, 
form coinstantaneous wholes, in other words, that acts of sense perception do not involve a process of becoming, but have their being nonetheless without involving such a process, yet, just as, in the case of sound, though the stroke which causes the sound has been already struck, the sound is not yet at the ear, and that this last is a fact is further proved by the transformation which the letters viz. The consonants as heard undergo in the case of words spoken from a distance, implying that the local movement involved in sound takes place in the space between us and the speaker, for the reason why persons addressed from a distance do not succeed in catching the sense of what is said is evidently that the air sound wave in moving towards them has its form changed, granting this, then, the question arises. Is the same also true in the case of color and light? For certainly it is not true that the beholder sees, and the object is seen, in virtue of some merely abstract relationship between them, such as that between equals. For if it were so, there would be no need as there is that either the beholder or the thing beheld should occupy some particular place, since to the equalization of things there being near to, or far from, one another makes no difference. Now this traveling through successive positions in the medium may with good reason take place as regards sound and odor, for these, like their media air and water, are continuous, but the movement of both is divided into parts. This too is the ground of the fact that the object which the person first in order of proximity hears or smells is the same as that which each subsequent person perceives, while yet it is not the same. Some, indeed, raise a question also on these very points, they declare it impossible that one person should hear, or see, or smell, the same object as another, urging the impossibility of several persons in different places hearing or smelling the same object, for the one same thing would thus be divided from itself. The answer is that, in perceiving the object which first set up the motion e.g. A bell, or frankincense, or fire all perceive an object numerically one and the same, while, of course, in the special object perceived they perceive an object numerically different for each, though specifically the same for all, and this, accordingly, explains how it is that many persons together see, or smell, or hear the same object. These things the odor or sound proper are not bodies, but an affection or process of some kind, otherwise this viz. Simultaneous perception of the one object by many would not have been, as it is, a fact of experience, though, on the other hand, thiakim ply a body as their cause. But though sound and odor may travel with regard to light the case is different. For light has its raison d'etre in the being not becoming of something, but it is not a movement. And in general, even in qualitative change the case is different from what it is in local movement both being different species of kinesis. Local movements, of course, arrive first at a point midway before reaching their goal, and sound, it is currently believed, is a movement of something locally moved, but we cannot go on to assert this arrival at a point midway like manner of things which undergo qualitative change. For this kind of change may conceivably take place in a thing all at once, without one half of it being changed before the other, e.g. It is conceivable that water should be frozen simultaneously in every part. But still, for all that, if the body which is heated or frozen is extensive, each part of it successively is affected by the part contiguous while the part first changed in quality is so changed by the cause itself which originates the change, and thus the change throughout the whole need not take place coinstantaneously in all atoms. Tasting would have been as smelling now is, if we lived in a liquid medium, and perceived the sapid object at a distance, before touch and jit. Naturally, then, the parts of media between a sensory organ and its object are not all affected at once except in the case of light illumination for the reason above stated, and also in the case of seeing, for the same reason, for light is an efficient cause of seeing. Another question respecting sense perception is as follows. Assuming, as is natural, 
that of two simultaneous sensory stimuli the stronger always tends to extrude the weaker from consciousness, is it conceivable or not that one should be able to discern two objects co-instantaneously in the same individual time? The above assumption explains why persons do not perceive what is brought before their eyes, if they are at the time deep in thought, or in a fright, or listening to some loud noise. This assumption, then, must be made and also the following. That it is easier to discern each object of sense when in its simple form than when an ingredient in a mixture, easier, for example, to discern wine when neat than when blended, and so also honey, and in other provinces a color, or to discern the neat by itself alone, than when sounded with the hypate in the octave, the reason being that component elements tend to efface the distinctive characteristics of one another. Such is the effect on one another of all ingredients of which, when compounded, some one thing is formed. If, then, the greater stimulus tends to expel the less, it necessarily follows that, when they concur, this greater should itself too be less distinctly perceptible than if it were alone, since the less by blending with it has removed some of its individuality. According to our assumption that simple objects are in all cases more distinctly perceptible. Now, if the two stimuli are equal but heterogeneous, no perception of either will ensue, they will alike efface one another's characteristics. But in such a case the perception of either stimulus in its simple form is impossible. Hence either there will then be no sense perception at all, or there will be a perception compounded of both and differing from either. The latter is what actually seems to result from ingredients blended together, whatever may be the compound in which they are so mixed. Since, then, from some concurrent sensory stimuli a resultant object is produced, while from others no such resultant is produced, and of the latter sort are those things which belong to different sense provinces, for only those things are capable of mixture whose extremes are contraries and no one compound can be formed from, e.g. white and sharp, except indirectly, i.e. not as a concord is formed of sharp and grave, there follows logically the impossibility of discerning such concurrent stimuli co-instantaneously. For we must suppose that the stimuli, when equal, tend alike to efface one another, since no one form of stimulus results from them, while, if they are unequal, the stronger alone is distinctly perceptible. Again, the soul would be more likely to perceive co-instantaneously, with one and the same sensory act, two things in the same sensory province, such as the grave and the sharp in sound, for the sensory stimulation in this one province is more likely to be unitemporal than that involving two different provinces, as sight and hearing but it is impossible to perceive two objects co-instantaneously in the same sensory act unless they have been mixed, when, however, they are no longer two, for their amalgamation involves their becoming one, and the sensory act related to one object is itself one, and such act, when one, is, of course, co-instantaneous with itself. Hence, when things are mixed we of necessity perceive them co-instantaneously for we perceive them by a perception actually one. For an object numerically one means that which is perceived by a perception actually one, whereas an object specifically one means that which is perceived by a sensory act potentially one i.e. by an energia of the same sensuous faculty. If then the actualized percept Ionis one, it will declare its data to be one object, they must, therefore, have been mixed. Accordingly, when they have not been mixed, the actualized perceptions which perceive them will be two, but if so, their perception must be successive not co-instantaneous, for in one and the same faculty the perception actualized at any single moment is necessarily one, only one stimulation or exertion of a single faculty being possible at a single instant, and in the case supposed here the faculty is one. It follows, therefore that we cannot conceive the possibility of perceiving two distinct objects co-instantaneously with own and the same sense. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.